Hey, there we go, buddy. Oh, I can see myself. So, you know, the defense is going to be starting in about, I don't know, mostly a couple minutes. Yeah, this is like the room setup, as you guys could see. You can't really see the projector too well, but yeah, the lights will be down. So I'll be having the the slides appear on the screen, so you all see it. It'll be fine and easy and dandy. So yeah, um, yeah. So you, if you want to see like the intro stuff and I guess all my panicking leading up to it, you could you could watch. <laughs> But the defense isn't starting until one o'clock, so be beware. That's pretty good. Let's see. I don't know. Oh, maybe I should just move this. Ah, oh, there we go. Also, all of you guys out there who's been wishing me like good luck, I just want to say thank you for all of like the well wishes and whatnot. I am going to be recording this also like in HD, so it'll be on my, um, I'll probably upload it on my channel or something like later on. So you get the whole shebang. You guys will not be able to see my closed part of my defense, which is essentially when um, they they close the door and like tell all of the people to leave and then they like grill me for however long so we'll see i have dr bomb stock which is he's a pretty good he's a real gorilla so we'll see um yeah so you know how i'm feeling right now i'm a little bit nervous uh i just did a little run through with my pi she's like the best ever she gonna get food so i hope she like get some good food but um, I'm not eating before this defense because why? That would just be like a massive diarrhea. So um, I say it so a lot because that's probably going to be my transition word. Inside of defense, Dr. Moore pretty cool. She, you know, like, I don't know. I just blabbling. Like, hope all is, hope all goes well. Like, y'all seeing all of this, um, let me let me make it so y'all can see just my face. So, um, what else I was I gonna say? I feel like I feel like everything's pretty okay. Um, just a little bit nervous. Let's put um, webcam. This so. Yeah, um, oh, y'all could get like a much better view of the room. So this is the whole room set up. Uh, background story, my PI actually defended inside here. I didn't even know that. Like I just was booking a room, trying to see if I could get a room to book. And she tell me, oh yeah, by the way, this is the room that I defended in. So I was like, yeah, keeping it in the family, you know, just all of that stuff. And then... Mr. Dr. Warren, I hear, is tuning in. So, thanks, Mr. Dr. Warren, for watching this. I guess I was just telling Dr. Warren, you like my daddy, you know, because he was the Mr. Dr. Warren. Yeah. Um, I actually feel more calmer since I, I guess, talking and spilling my life guts to y'all. So, yeah. I don't know how many people like it was there I guess y'all first time watching um, a defense 
uh, just going on you Facebook right now, telling everybody live streaming my pre thoughts <laughs> to the defense <laughs> on my channel. So yeah, I see my mommy log on Facebook. I don't really know. I tell everybody I was gonna be doing a Facebook live, but you know. <laughs> It's not really good quality on the Facebook Live, so I don't know if I'm going to do it. Every time I look, like, off, maybe I should just, like, put the center here or something. Because I feel like i just looking at myself and y'all like, why your eyes keep dotting off? Anyway, so, yeah, this is my defense room. My lab actually is right across there, so it's pretty, like, in the family. I just sent somebody off to go get some donuts and chips and um, drinks and stuff. So it'll be good. Hopefully he comes back um, in a perfect amount of time. And yeah, I'm also vlogging. I vlogged all my feelings leading up to this. So that'll be my first vlog ever on my channel. Um, yeah. Uh, So, uh, who else? If you guys have any questions out there, I guess y'all could ask me. Because I see y'all live stream. Sorry, I popping up all my stuff. But, yeah. Ooh! So, my little bell just went off telling me that it is my defense at 1 o'clock. Um, I'm going to press snooze or dismiss. But yeah, just nerves, nerves hitting right now. Maybe I see two people watching. I know I was one of the people, so I don't know who whoever the next person is. Hi, you should comment so I know who you are. But yeah. Um, so I feel like nobody tells you, or one of the things that's not said is how to prepare. I guess prepare how do you know when you're like ready I guess um I don't know I don't know how you know when you're ready I know Dr. Moran knows when that I was ready so thank you Dr. Moran um I see one person watching out <laughs> what else <laughs> why say that why say that oh my gosh um, so I just have some work that I'm going to be needing to like set up so pause So one of the things that I know that I'm supposed to be doing, or I went to a conference and they said one of the things you should do is like a power pose. So let me go and practice some of my power poses. Like, so this is one of the first power poses. It's like, I'm strong. I know what to do. I can do it. This is like the power pose. You're supposed to look at yourself like, like just, I am strong, I am invincible, I am invincible. And then the next one is like, yeah, yeah. I ain't like, why are these power poses like this? Like, uh, But you're supposed to feel confident, like, who am I? I know I'm good. I know I could do it. And you know, literally, I feel like a PhD is just psyching yourself up. It's like psyching yourself up to make sure you, you like, could do stuff. I need to go get my little jacket so I feel like, cause I like like little jackets. <laughs> this looks so weird. Why am I so weird? Like, ah. Oh, also, for those of you who are inside of the live chat watching this stream, you know, you could comment and say hi or whatnot. Introduce yourself to the whole 
farm bomb out there. I just say farm bomb. What else? <laughs> okay. So now we have someone coming in, bringing. What, you buy cups or Dr. Murray give you them cups? Dr. Murray gave them cups. Okay, because I just gonna say I don't want you buy no cups. So yeah, everybody yeah, like that's trickling that's in now. Um, everyone's well, trickling in. So it's like, like ah, call it a survey instrument? Uh, well, so it will be fine, you guys. It'll be fine. Well, it's not like a, so they have survey, and then they have oh a survey gosh. instrument. Yeah, I found it. Okay. If that's really a survey, it's not really a survey. It's not. So you have nervousness. <laughs> oh, Louis, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is pre pre whatever. I don't know if all the fences is be like this, you know, just the chill time before, but it's good it like calms your nerves it's like breathing you know everybody really in the room to support you so it's just trying to like you know feel it you know feel like oh man this is a combination it's a combination of all of like everything like everything so you don't need this stuff no I don't I got I got it to work so yeah, you guys, you should have seen me like the night before. I was trying to figure out how to get this like live stream and I bought an HDMI cord and I didn't realize HDMI is just for when you do an output, but you need an input cord in order to do it. And I just was like, oh my gosh, I don't know, I don't know. But I mean, it worked out. I just ended up oh getting God, a, a, a HD camera. Oh, Dr. Wonsai is there. Like, Oh, hey, that's the most nice. In the box. Uh, yeah, yeah. Takes a village. But that says assessment form. Oh, it's a sense. Oh, yeah. So, I need you to just click through my slides here. Is that okay? Oh. Like, all you have to do is when I have it up. No, I mean, I have it for that computer, but not this one. It's not a questionnaire. You so want the people that to be able to see your slides. Yeah. So, this one will have it. Yeah, then put a description. So all you and need to do is just yeah, like, just when you see me click, it. like you it's just click. Okay, I have a clicker, I'll just do it. Okay. Yeah, you go. So click. Yeah. That should be it. Yeah. Is she doing it? Is she making? Oh, this one is yours? Oh, okay. Mine's the expensive one. Okay, I'm just. We have two side on the one. Okay. 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 Okay.
course that it would take you to have multiple instructors. So it, it's not just two years. I thought it was bad. Yeah. I mean, I think I just said 12. 12 and maybe more because we have honorary people who just I think maybe you have 12 students, three have instructors. instructors. Yeah. So, yeah. They feel I mean, each effective. person, yeah, uh, the normal would, would get a third of a course. So you could get, you could get twice four. So we were wondering if, we, if it was something that we have to say, or if, if we could just go ahead and do it. So well, might some department might not give you any credit, but it's up to the department chair. When so it's a departmental thing. Yeah, I think the department gets. Because we have somebody from biology, we have somebody from neuro. You could give one person well, all the credit, parts, you know, and other people just guess uh, that, or if you Right, yeah, I'm kind of guess that, but they're coming in and doing like one So one person one can get. Get tone credit, then that one person will be responsible. The other people get no credit. Basically, they do free lectures, uh, guest lectures. You don't get credit for. But with only twelve students, it'd be hard to get more than one per one for a credit. It's, that's usually what the minimum you can teach a uh, up to level class is twelve. Right, I think try to. Like three thousand people. Yeah, twelve is honors. I mean, honors. Like, yeah, we have the pending courses. We do this, like, you know, little, oh, I didn't know that. So, um, I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, twelve. Come at the same time. You know, extra credit. So, case was, you know, we are doing. Is this something? Wow, that's what you have to be careful. So it's a course. You gotta get, you know, you gotta have a scheduled time. Mm -hmm. You're not doing the scheduled time. But if one was called like the time, you know, Yeah, but like that's uh, 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 the guys would be tough to learn twelve if they don't show up. So you you can either get in tons of extra faculty work or little right. so, so that's or cool. less effective or something. So I was like, can we just have Sign a piece of paper that uh, they will acknowledge they will attend these meetings. Uh, and you know, again, that's what we do in LSAP. So that, you know, when you sign up for LSAP, you have to go to the meetings and know you uh, as part of your commitment when you receive the money. You're fine. Right. Okay. Uh, Switch and oh. takes everything off. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a good system at all. Yeah. Yeah. 
So what essentially is chemistry education research? So as you can see at the top, there's this like big umbrella. Essentially, chemistry education research is understanding and improving chemistry teaching and learning. So some of the questions that you would ask inside of chemistry education research is, how do students learn chemistry? What can we do to better facilitate the learning of chemistry? Why do students have difficulty learning chemistry? So the, the reason why we as chemists are the ones solely tasked to do this chemistry education research is because we have a sound background in the concepts of chemistry. Everything that's going on, nucleophiles, electrophiles, all of that stuff, we have that background knowledge. And what we as chemists, we can then do is we can apply these educational psychology, sociology methods of research to these students and understand how are students understanding this chemistry that we're teaching them. So, you know, to better facilitate how they learn and then hopefully contribute to some type of curriculum change. So now that you have an orientation about what chemistry education research is, there are a few methods in which we go about it. The two main ones are a quantitative methodology or a qualitative approach. Now here, if, you, if I draw you guys to this, this part right here, scientific method. So inside of normal or, or experimental research inside of chemistry, remember you have this hypothesis and you're trying to test this hypothesis, trying to prove or disprove it and see what is the real answer or how to draw yourself to an answer. So quantitative research is that kind of like that. This is confirmatory. You already come in with this hypothesis. You're trying to prove or disprove this hypothesis. And that is what quantitative research is. Whereas qualitative research is more of something we call exploratory. So what I mean when I say exploratory is that some type of phenomena is happening inside of these students what we as researchers, we're trying to find out why that phenomena is occurring. So that kind of leads me to the groups that you would study inside of these two types of, of research methods. So in quantitative methods, they're normally larger sample sizes, larger groups of participants, because what you're trying to do is prove this hypothesis and try to get to some type of generalizable conclusion so that you can apply it to multiple or different populations. We're so inside of qualitative research. These are small numbers, and they are not randomly selected because we are looking at a specific group of students. We're trying to study the phenomena that's happened inside of that group. We're trying to figure out why are students <coughs> viewing something this particular way, <coughs> which then leads to the type of data you would collect. Because you're inside of quantitative, you're getting large numbers. You want to make generalizable conclusions you end up gathering more statistical data. We're so in qualitative data. You're trying to, you're trying to study this phenomenon. You're trying to get a re rich, in-depth view of what's going on inside of the student's mind. So that kind of draws or leads the type of data that you collect, such as interviews, open-ended responses on surveys, uh, field notes, and you know reflections, like why is the student thinking about something the way they're thinking about it. So of course, that then leads to the type of results you have. Quantitative or more generalizable results, whereas qualitative <coughs> research is, is very specific to the type of group that you're studying. So qualitative research, oh my gosh, I didn't know, okay. So qualitative research, this is the type of research that I've been primarily conducting. I'm trying to find out or explore reasons why students think the way that they think. In, in terms or, or in a way to somehow affect curriculum change. So it's kind of like starting from, oh, okay, what's going on? Now that I know what you are thinking, I can then try and find some solution or help, help with that. So I kind of want to segue into theoretical frameworks. So in qualitative research, this is some, a tool that you use, something called a theoretical framework. Now what a theoretical framework is, it's a foundation for your research study. Essentially, how I like to, how I like to describe it, it's, it's like a lens in which you view your research through. Now when I say a lens, I want to put it in like chemistry terms for you guys. So if I'm trying to find the mass of a compound, I'm not going to use NMR to find out the mass of that compound. If I'm trying to find the chemical structure of that compound, I'm not going to use a mass spec. So a theoretical framework, when you choose it, it's a way at which you, you analyze your data 
you generate your questions, you, um, it's the method that, that controls how you, how you develop your whole study. So that's essentially what a theoretical framework is. It's kind of the foundation of your whole study and it allows you to design your study. So now you understand what qualitative research is. You understand one of the tools that you use in it, which is a theoretical framework. Uh, I want to orient you guys in why I'm looking at organic chemistry. So here I want you guys to look at the, the whole the progression of a chemistry student. So they start off in Gen Chem 1, move on to Gen Chem 2, we have Orga 1, and then from there students then move on to upper chemistry courses. So what's, what's interesting is that when students are inside of this organic chemistry course, they come in with something called prior knowledge. Prior knowledge just meaning knowledge they had from before. They gain this from places like high school, general chemistry one, general chemistry two, TV programs, you know, digging inside of the sign, things like that. <laughs> so students inside of this organic chemistry course, they come in with these prior conceptions. And what's interesting though is that from organic chemistry, students either go off into their upper chemistry courses or they go to med school, they go to orgo two, they go to grad school. So organic chemistry is like a gateway course into other chemistries or, or other career paths in a student's career, uh, a student or a, like a person's career. So that's why I'm choosing to look specifically at organic chemistry. Now organic chemistry education is affected by a multitude of things. Uh, one of the things I told you guys about was prior knowledge, like what they're coming into that course with. But other things that affect it are things like the laboratory experience, the instructional methods that they're introduced to by the teachers, things like their intellectual accessibility, things like affective factors, like what is their motivation inside of the course. So all of these things are combined together in like this dynamic, this dynamic interconnected web for how students understand chemistry. So that leads me into my projects. So one of the things that I'm doing is I'm looking at concept maps to see or as a way to assess students' understanding. So a little background on misconceptions. Now misconceptions inside of chemistry, they arise from prior knowledge that a student was probably exposed to. But essentially, a misconception is an idea, a concept, a thought that is just contrary to scientifically accepted information. That's like saying the, the sky is red, but it's, it's not red, it's blue. <laughs> so some of the background on misconceptions done inside of chemistry education is that students don't fully understand the concept of electronegativity. Students have a hard time understanding the whole bonding concept. Um, on a, in a study done by Pearson back inside of the 80s, 33% and 23% of high school students held misconceptions about bonding. Um, that was just from high school. So you can see that these misconceptions are being generated from, from at the high school age. Which high schools did you look at or should look at? Uh, is that in the study? Yeah, where was the study done? The study? Is it done in the south, middle, west? East. That's so, where we look at high schools. They're very different. Okay. <laughs> so the study at which he done it, it was it was inside of the. Let's see. I think it was the northeast area, somewhere around there. Do you know so, if they were public or private? Pardon me. Do you know if they were public or private? Oh, this. No, I don't know if it was a public or private school. Okay. Okay. So. He did this inside of these high schools, and we see that these misconceptions are being generated from at the high school time. Then we go on to Tabor. He did a study on misconceptions involving covalent bonding, and he found that students also have um, misconceptions in these other topics, like van der Waal forces, resonance structures, coordinate bonding, and what we here as chemical educators, we're trying to find out what are the misconceptions that these students are coming out with and how then we can identify these misconceptions. So misconceptions are, are very hard to recognize via the types of assessments that we do. You know, student can get a, a question right on an exam, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a correct idea about it. 
So then, how do we go about assessing these misconceptions? So the theoretical framework, the way that the, the theoretical framework would really guided my study about this, is constructivism. So constructivism basically says that individuals construct knowledge. So that's saying that you have, you're presented with this idea. The way that it's presented is not necessarily the way your mind is going to comprehend it or make sense of it. So one of the things with constructivism, it involves prior knowledge. So prior knowledge is, as I said before, knowledge that you gain from before you enter inside that course or the, the new concept that you're introduced to. So with constructivism, the prior knowledge that you have and the new knowledge that you have are somehow connected or you're making a connection with it inside of your mind to make sense of the whole concept you're introduced to. So essentially, is this combining of new knowledge to create some personal understanding to yourself? So that is my theoretical framework that is guiding this study. Another theoretical framework guiding this study is meaningful learning. So with meaningful learning, meaningful learning requires certain things to occur for a student to make a deep, rich connection with it. One of the things involves the type of prior knowledge that the student has. Is it correct or is it incorrect? How do you know what the prior knowledge is? The next thing is meaningful material. So just because you're presenting this to a student doesn't necessarily mean that student has a connection to this material. Another thing uh, involved in it is that the student has to choose whether or not they want to listen to the information being presented to them or, or, or disregard it. So meaningful learning has to, occurs when all of these three things are in sync inside of the student. The student chooses to learn it, the material that's being connected to them is meaningful, and then the prior knowledge that they have can build on this concept that they're being introduced to. Well, can you define meaningful? Meaningful? Yeah, what is, how do you define that? So meaningful essentially means that the students are making some type of deep, rich connection with the information that's being exposed to them. And it's not necessarily being uh, memorized inside of them. It's something that they're taking in and they're gonna be able to retrieve it on, you know, later on. <laughs> okay, so, so one of the things that we want to assess is prior knowledge. This prior knowledge is very important for our students to build upon. And one of the difficulties we as teachers have is how to assess this prior knowledge, which leads us to concept maps. So what a concept map is, it's a form of assessment. It's just a 3D representation of the 2D mind. It's kind of a way to see how students are making connections inside of their mind. So a concept map consists of something called nodes. Here you can see nodes are these things inside of the box. These are the concepts that the students are expected to connect. And then the next thing inside of a concept map is a linking phrase. So these are the things inside of the box. This is where students, this is the, the place where the students are making connections to the concepts. And you can see how they relate these two to each other. So now that you have an idea of a concept map, how it allows you to see inside the 2D world, I want you to bring your attention to a knowledge structure. So as you can see, I have these blocks. These are kind of like the foundation of a prior knowledge of a student. Sometimes students don't have as well understanding, which is something we term misconceptions. It's not scientifically accepted information. And these misconceptions create like a rocky, almost like, like a, a bad foundation for building upon with the rest of your structure. So what a knowledge structure essentially is telling you about is how do students connect these, these concepts inside of their mind and, and how is it in relation to each other. So it's just basically a schema for how a students understand a topic and it's the way they organize these concepts inside of their mind. So now I want you to draw your attention to what we call novice learning versus expert learning or knowledge. So inside of a knowledge, novice, 
A novice person to, or a novice, novice student to chemical education or, or organic chemistry or general chemistry, they tend to do something called rote learning. Rote learning is what we call memorization. So they're just trying to compact or jam all of this information inside of their mind, not necessarily making connections between these concepts or how they're related to each other. Whereas with us as experts, we have meaningful learning. We're able to make these multiple connections between concepts we have inside of chemistry, and we are able to see the shared meaning between these concepts. And one of the things with concept maps is they're able to allow you to see whether someone is more so inside of a novice learning or, or have novice knowledge of a subject, whereas an expert would have more interconnected relations between concepts, and that's something that a concept map would help us to differentiate between novice versus expert, or somewhere in between. So that leads me to my research questions, my guiding research questions that helped me formulate this whole study. So the first thing I wanted to look at is how well can concept maps uncover students' knowledge structures regarding bonding concepts? The next thing that I wanted to look at is identifying misconceptions. So are there differences in the explanation between students who have high concept map scores versus students who have low concept map scores regarding bonding concepts? My methodology and which how I carried all of this out. So our students were, we had 17 students inside of the study. I would like to thank my participants. But we had 17 students inside of the study. So they had to sign a consent form they had to receive, um, they did receive a $10 gift certificate for participating in that interview. Each of them lasted about an hour. And the first part of the interview consisted of them constructing concept maps. Now here, as you can see, this is the list of all of the concepts that were provided for them to connect on the concept map. So these would be what the nodes are on the concept map. After they constructed their concept map, we had them do think aloud interviews. Now with Think Aloud interviews, is basically a student solving a problem, but while they're solving a problem, they're talking through it and you're listening to what are the things they're saying? How are they making sense of this? What is the reasoning for their choices inside of these Think Aloud interviews? And then I'm just gonna walk you guys through how this data was paired, the concept map with the Think Aloud interview, and it was analyzed. So first, let's look at the concept map. So this is an example of one of the concept maps for one of the students I had. So there is a grading scale by which each concept link is done by. So this would constitute one concept link right here. And on a three point or three to zero point grading scale, this could either be scientifically correct and relevant, correct but scientifically thin, partially incorrect, or incorrect and is scientifically irrelevant. So these are the three, the, the four different types of scores a student can have. So on this particular link, I want you to show you how it was scored. So we had two graders participating inside of this. We had grader one, grader two, and each of them gave their specific grade for this concept. Grader one gave it a one, grader two gave it a two. So how we then categorize or find out how much this concept is linked, we take the average of that. So this concept earns a link of 1.5. So that's how we're able to take this qualitative data and translate it into quantitative uh, measurements so that we can look at it. So who generated the map, the student or the listener? These are the student generated maps. So from the interview, but they didn't put boxes around it. Somebody had to put boxes around it. So, yeah, well. this is a software that these students have. It's called HMAPS. Um, so, inside of HMAPS, you have boxes where you can put the concepts inside of it. So, a student typed all of these, and then the student made the connection between these. Now, it was a little bit more messy. I did clean it up so, like, this is straight and these are straight. But this is a student-generated concept map. <coughs> so after they constructed these concept maps, we took them along on a Think Aloud interview. 
Now with Think Aloud interviews, one of the things you need to do is you need to like orient the student before they start addressing a problem that you have them. So one of the ways we oriented our students is we introduced them to this concept in Muntari, which is the implicit information from Lewis Structures Instrument. This is done by Melanie Cooper. And basically, it's just like a questionnaire. So the question says, what information could you determine using the Lewis structure and any other chemistry knowledge you have? So if the student thinks that from a Lewis structure you can determine polarity, they would click it. If they think you can't determine any information from a Lewis structure, they would check that box right there. So after students went through that, we introduced them to a problem. So this is one of the problems from our Think Aloud interviews. Which of the following best represents the position of a shared electron pair of the HF molecule? So they had these two choices. And these two choices is what the students were able to choose in our first round. And then we introduced these, um, we introduced these phrases right here, which we call distractors. So it allows students to talk through or, or uh, kind of get distracted and to see whether or not they really understood what the concept between these two answers was asking them. So they, they chose their answer and then they looked at one of these and then they chose another reasoning behind why they chose the answer. And then from there, we're gonna look at how this data was analyzed and paired. So for our quantitative analysis, we took our concept maps, we were graded on a zero to three point scale. We did inter-rater reliability between the two graders, which is just basically how much do they agree with a certain concept link to make sure that there is some type of consistency between it. Then we checked for, oh gosh, then we checked for normality to check see if our data set does follow a normal distribution. We then looked at, or we identified upper and lower tertiles, which just means we segregated our group of students into thirds. From there, we did our qualitative analysis. So we transcribed, or I transcribed interviews, which is a very, very intensive process. It is the equivalent of doing a <laughs> column. Then we did open coding on this data. Open coding basically is you're looking through the interviews, trying to pull out common themes inside of it. Then we did constant comparison. The constant comparison method is, is after you've generated your codes, you're looking back and forth to see if the codes agree with each other or if there, there is a code that is common that you can then collapse together. And from there, we took all of the codes that we already generated via constant comparison method and we collapsed them into general themes. So things that were in common, things that students said that were in common. So the results. So for our electronegativity and polar bonding, this is the, con the question that we focused on, or I will focus on inside of this talk. And then here, you can see our students. Now I gave each student a pseudonym. This is just, this is not their real name. Um, so these are their concept map scores. And this section right here tells you whether or not they got the correct answer before the distractors were shown to them, which is the A, B, C, D. And then here tells you whether or not they got the correct answer after the distractors were shown to them. So here's an example of a low student. Here is the link that he made. Billings electrons are involved in electronegativity. This received a score when we combined the two um, graders of 1.5. So here is the problem, or here is his answer to the problem that he selected. He selected the one where the electron pairs are more so towards the fluorine. So let's look at what he said. So she, Luan, said, I chose D, which is this one, let's look at it. Fluorine is the larger of the two atoms and hence exerts greater control over the shared electron pair. So Luan said, I chose D because it says fluorine is the larger of the two. I chose that because according to the number of valence electrons, it has seven and hydrogen has one. So therefore, when you're thinking of electronegativity, it pulls more. So this student, Luan, she thinks that valence electrons are somehow involved 
or dictate electronegativity of a molecule. Here we see another student making the connection. Electronegativity increases as you go past the, so le from left to right and bottom to top. He's talking about the periodic table. Metals. <laughs> so let's look. This score, this, this link received a score of 0 0.5. And this is the answer that the student chose inside of the Think Aloud interview, where you see the electron pair is equally shared between fluorine. So let's look at, let's take a look at what the student said. So London said um, before, like I've never seen this before or like that because like I think H is just there and like I don't know. So the student clearly doesn't have any concept of how electronegativity relates or, or how to even interpret electronegativity inside of this question. But let's take a look at a high score inside of a concept map. So these are the two links our high score made. Electronegativity determines whether or not a bond is polar covalent. Another link is covalent bonds in a water molecule contains a net dipole moment, which is due to each element's level of electronegativity, polar, polar covalent bond. So both of these links for this high score made a score of 2.5 out of 3. So that's pretty good. So let's see what the student selected. The student selected one where the electron pair is closer to fluorine. Then we want to find out what did the student actually select, like were they distracted by the distractors? How sound is their knowledge inside of it? So let's see. So Hilda says, okay, so I think what it's trying to make you understand here is electronegativity. Bear in mind, nothing was mentioned that this is an electronegativity question. <laughs> so she goes on further to say fluorine is more electronegative. So I would say it would be the first one because it's pulling those electrons back while it's still sharing. It's kind of hogging them, <laughs> as she says. So you can see that Hilda has this clear understanding of electronegativity and how that plays a role in, in the bond or sharing of a bond. So some of the major themes that we saw inside of uh, this study was that some students says valence electrons determine electronegativity. Here you see Angel saying more electrons makes it stronger than the hydrogen, which is referencing the fluorine. Another theme that came up was equal equals more electronegative, or, or a large equals more electronegative. So here you see Harper saying fluorine is bigger, right? I think it's from physics. The greater the mass, the greater the attraction. <laughs> And another, another theme emerging out of this is electric negativity has no effect on bonding. So here you see Anna Marie saying, well, I know fluorine has a higher electric ne negativity than hydrogen, but I don't think that's affecting like the position of the shared pair of electrons. So some of the conclusions, drew, some of the conclusions drawn from this study was that concepts maps were able to uncover gaps inside of students' knowledge structure. And you were able to see a differentiation between high scoring students versus low scoring students. You're able to see how they're thinking about electronegativity inside of the molecule. Um, some other themes drawing out was that electronegativity, the high scoring students, they understood it, while the low scoring students were kind of confused um, by periodic trends, and they attributed electronegativity to the number of, a, of valence electrons. Um, another theme brought out inside of the concept maps where we were able to identify their thoughts on polar covalent bonds. Um, so high, stu high scoring students, they associated bond, oh gosh, Nikita. Okay, <laughs> high scoring students, they associated bond polarity with electronegativity differences while the low scoring students were kind of confused about covalent bonding with ionic bonding. They didn't understand the dynamic of a, a polar, valent, um, polar covalent bond and how does that fit in with a, a complete covalent bond and an ionic bond. Um, we also saw the effect of electronegativity on bond polarity being another theme drawn out from the data where high scoring students 
They understood that electronegativity affected the position of the shared pair, where the low scoring students thought that electronegativity had no effect on the position. And then in terms of the content map construction, our high scoring students did make meaningful connections, whereas our low scoring students, some of them made no connections on the content map scores because they didn't understand or they had no concept of how to link these concepts together. So, so some of the teaching implications from this, this research is that concept maps, they can be used as a pre-assessment or like a formative assessment to see how n students' knowledge structures are and how students are connecting these concepts together. We also can use concept maps to determine which concepts and connections need to be explicitly taught. So just as how some students think that valence electrons are what's contributing to ele electronegativity, maybe we should like explicitly say, hey, they are not. <laughs> And then also, we could probably use concept maps to design more meaningful curricula, which focus on fundamental chemistry concepts. So that's part one of my talk. This is an orientation of how to use a concept map as an assessment. Now I wanna take you guys into the next part of my talk, which is my baby, um, where we're looking at investigating student laboratory experiences inside of a project-based lab. So, so why are we studying labs inside of the first place? So currently labs, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of money, they use up a lot of chemicals. Students, like they go in, sometimes they say they don't really know what's going on. And inside of the chemistry education research literature, there is actually insufficient data to confirm or reject whether or not labs have this meaningful experience on the students, whether or not students are getting something from this laboratory experience. I'm not saying that they're not, but there is no data to back that up. So, no huh. data to back it up in the chemical research? Or the chemistry education, people. chemistry education and some research of this done for 40 years. Right, That's which we, we're, not, we're <laughs> not negating that, but what we're saying is that in terms of some studies that are investigating them. There are very few of them out there. So based on this, this study from Austin, he said that there is a real need to pursue vigorous research on learning through laboratory activities. So basically, we need to study why laboratories are or are not effective and like try to tease out the reasons why students um, are, are experiencing the experiences they have inside of laboratory. So a little bit of background about how students experience labs. So one area that has been growing inside of chemistry education is that student um, researchers are starting to look at the goals, perspectives, and experiences students have inside of the chemistry laboratory. Um, there is a study done where they, they invented this chemistry, this laboratory curriculum called the CASPI. So this was a more open-ended or open inquiry lab. Now when I say open inquiry lab, that means that students are not given the exact procedures what to do. They're not given the answers to the problem. They're going in and they're performing this experiment without much or very little guidance. So that's an open inquiry lab. So this group, they studied these CASPI students who were inside of this open inquiry laboratory experience and they found that they felt more confident, they better understood the application of the laboratory, they felt accomplished in their work, and they felt more motivated to learn. More so as this a more recent study done by the Cover and Towns, they studied a more traditional lab. So a traditional lab, um, those of you who came from other like research institutions or institutions of higher education, a traditional lab is something that we term a cookbook lab, meaning more so that the students are given the problems, the procedures, they're given the answers. There's, there's not much to what they investigate inside the lab. So inside of this traditional lab, the Coburn Towns found that students often sought out correct answers, they tried to avoid mistakes inside of the lab. They liked finishing early, and they liked completing the necessary requirements to earn the grade and not doing beyond that. 
So that's a little bit about the background of students' experiences inside of the lab. But I wanted to draw you guys to attention to the type of lab curricula that we have here at Georgia State University. So the curricula we have at Georgia State University is something we call a project-based lab. What that means is that students are sent into the lab with some type of project to complete over a multiple weeks. Um, inside of our lab curricula, our Gen Chem 1, Gen Chem 2, Orgo 1, and Orgo 2 labs are inside of this format, meaning that each of them have their own specific problem. Inside of our Gen Chem 1 sequence, they are to identify unknown organic acids. In Gen Chem 2, they're preparing and identifying this complex. In Gen Chem, sorry, Orgo 1, they're separating and identifying mixtures of organic compounds. And then in Orgo 2, they're creating this chalcone and then further making derivatives from it. So often inside of our chemistry courses inside of Georgia State University, students come into our labs with no little or, or traditional lab experiences. So what our laboratory curriculum tries to do, it tries to scaffold them, and lead them up to the point where they're able to do research inside of research labs um, and something that we call open inquiry format, you know, where they're going out and, it's, and doing the science in the lab. So that kind of moves from a more structured approach to a less structured approach. Because you know when you're inside of the lab, you're literally just trying to figure out how to do this experiment. But I want to draw you guys' attention to the Organic Chemistry 2 lab here at Georgia State University, which was the focus of my study, trying to find out how are these students functioning inside or experiencing this laboratory environment before they go off into research labs or go off men's school or, or whatnot. So the project-based lab here at Georgia State University, it's uh, done in a mini-master, that's like a seven-week course, which is different from the traditional 14-week course. Um, they make, the, they have this aldehyde and this ketone, they do a reaction, they form this chalcone, and then from there, they do several different reactions on it, make derivatives. And from there, they're able to select a few of them <coughs> and then choose which type of reaction they want to do in it. So for the labs here at Georgia State University, they meet twice a week. It's one hour, <coughs> it's one hour pre-lab, and then they have a four hour lab period. How that's done is over two days inside of the week, so that means they meet for a total of 10 hours per week. The way that they're assessed inside of this lab is normally through quizzes and, and homeworks. They have a final exam, and they also have a final lab report. So that's an idea of the structure of the project-based lab here at Georgia State University for our Organic 2 lab course. So some of the research questions I wanted to find out about this lab was, what do students perceive as the purpose of the Organic Chemistry 2 project-based lab? And then, how do students view or describe their success inside of this lab? I also wanted to see what are the different ways students experience this organic chemistry to project-based lab, and then from there, how do students' perceptions affect the way they approach learning inside of the lab? <coughs> so the theoretical framework which guided this study is something we call situated cognition. Now what situated cognition does, is it, it, it integrates or it looks at constructivism, which is students internally making sense of the knowledge. <coughs> it also encompasses social constructivism, which deals with how, do, how does an individual learn from the social environment around them. Now with situated cognition, it looks at these two, but in a specific environment. And this environment is the laboratory. So another methodological or uh, theoretical framework that we use for this is phenomenography. Now what phenomenography is saying is that we have a student and they're inside of this particular environment. They're experiencing a certain phenomenon, right? So what we do as researchers, we're trying to find out what are all the different ways that students can experience this phenomenon, this phenomenon being the laboratory setting. <coughs> So that then leads to the methodology that we took or to carry out this experiment. So 
at a large urban university here inside of Atlanta. <laughs> <coughs> We have this certain set of demographics, and our study demographics reflected it. Is it okay if I get one up? <laughs> My hands look really dry. Okay, so we did this study at this large urban research intensive institution. And how we carried out this study is we did semi-structured interviews. Now what a semi-structured interview is a set of questions that you predetermine, you go into the interview with those, and you interview the student. But you that doesn't necessarily mean that whatever the students say, you negate. You follow the student wherever they lead you inside of the interview to see are there certain themes or, or what comes up inside of the interview. So this was done over two semesters, the fall and the spring semester. We did pre-interviews and we did post-interviews. For our pre-interviews, we had 21 students, but for our post-interview, only 18 came back. So we're going to be focusing on our post-interviews for the study. There was a selection criteria, which involved the students had to have done general chemistry two in Orgo one here at this university to make sure they were already exposed to the project-based um, format or curricula at this institution. They had to be 18 years or older and they, we had to get signed and form consent from them. Now each interview lasted around 30 minutes and students did receive a $20 gift card compensation for coming to the interview. I didn't get any money when I got an so for our student transcripts, what we did is we, we transcribed each interview. <coughs> then we did open coding on those interviews. <coughs> After that, we did the constant comparison method. And then we ended up generating overall themes from that data. From there, though, we tried to extract, extract or tease out student experiences inside the lab based on their interview. So we did something called inductive summary data coding, which means we looked at the interview as a whole to see what was the overall theme or experience coming from that student's um, interview. So let's look at the results. So first, we're gonna talk about the purpose. What do students perceive as the purpose of this organic chemistry two lab? So inside of that, or inside of our study, we found that out of our 18 participants inside of the study, um, a good 12 of them identified lab skills and techniques as one of the purposes of the lab. But interestingly enough, right, interestingly enough, our students also identified these other purposes of the lab, which is what we call theory to practice, meaning that students see lab as um, putting into practice all of the theory that you learn inside of the lecture course. Students also viewed this project-based lab as a chance to cultivate independence, a chance to become this independent researcher and not rely on your instructor. Students also saw this as a chance to learn problem solving. How do I go about fixing this reaction? How do I tweak it? Now what's interesting, why is that up more than 100%? Are okay. students giving more than one answer? Right, so students inside of the study, they were able to identify more than one, um, I guess, purpose inside of the lab, which is very interesting. That leads me to my next point. So inside of the traditional lab, students were, so, were mainly focused or only were able to identify like lab skills as the purpose of the lab. Whereas inside of our project-based lab, our students did identify lab skills as one of the purposes, but they also identified these other more or more meaningful, like theory to practice, independence, problem solving, as a purpose of the lab, which I think is very interesting. So then how do our students go about defining their success inside of this lab? So here, inside of the interviews, our students were able to identify grades, of course. That's one of the ways that they measure their success inside of the lab. But what's also interesting is that our students not only 
define their success by their grade, but they also were able to define their success by things like productivity, understanding how independent they were inside of the lab. And this is also another interesting find, because compared to the Decover and Town <coughs> study, students mainly perceive their success by avoiding mistakes, finishing early, getting a good grade, whereas our students were able to see their success in good grades, yes, but through being able to understand the content, feeling independent with that content, being productive inside of the lab. And one, one of the interesting things is that they saw their success through this productivity. So in looking at how they perceive their success through productivity, we see some of the students <coughs> view their excess through percent yield. Oh my gosh. <coughs> so here we have Valerie, one of our students inside of the study. <laughs> and Valerie said, I always base my success on my percent yield because you know, that's just what I do. <coughs> Another student <coughs> inside of the lab, Daria, she said, so this one went really smooth and really nice and I really enjoyed it. So here she is referencing that inside of the organic lab, she was able to you know, perform her experiment and it went good. So she viewed her success through <coughs> this productivity inside of the lab. Which that leads me to my next research question which I wanted to find out. What are the experiences that students are having in this project-based lab? Which was my most interesting question inside of the study. So we were able to find eight distinct ways how students perceive this project-based lab. So one of the ways students perceive it is what we call the time saver like experience or perception. This is where a student just focused on efficiency and saving time. Um, my voice is like really dry right now, that's okay. Um, then we also have someone called the socialite experience. This student experienced the lab through social interactions. So other students and interactions with the teacher in the lab. We have the skill developer who focused on gaining skills for employment. We also have the independent researcher whose main focus was on building that independence in the lab. Detail oriented, that was an experience brought out. And this is the type of student that was focused on gathering details of their experiment. They were kind of tripped up uh, and not able to, to function in the lab because of things like the lab manual didn't exactly give them everything that they needed. We also had the Explorer Experience, which was a student who loved exploring the unknown nature of science, being able to find out um, different ways that which, um, different ways to carry out an experiment or, or the unknownness of the actual science. We also have the Mastery Experience, where these students are focused on understanding the lab's connection to the lecture, mastering the concepts taught inside the lab. And then we have the apathetic experience. We, these are just students there who are not interested in, and it's very hard because they're not interested in one reason or another, not necessarily because of the lab. So I wanna take you guys through a couple of examples. So let's look at the time saver experience. This experience was focused on efficiency and saving time. So here we have Edward saying, giving a, a quote about his experience. Like in the beginning, I felt like I was really slow in all the experiments, like especially with the chalcone experiment, creating your own chalcone. As the lab progressed, I actually like picked up speed and I was able to, you know, do my experiments on time. So he's looking at his experience in the lab as being efficient, being able to do these experiments in a timely manner. He even further went on to show like how his choices were oriented around this time saver experience. Here we see him saying for his compound, for his experiment that he selected at the end of the class or his student selected experiment. I chose the four hydroxy because I had epoxide that I had used that was good for the experiment and plus it was really fast. <laughs> well, just the preparation for everything was fast. <laughs> Next, we have the detail-oriented perspective. So this student focused on the details of lab to aid inside of her decision making. So here we have Primrose, a, a prime example, saying mistakes on the whole, I mean, it's definitely a little bit scary. Um, she goes on further to talk about it. 
you know, but overall, it's just a part of life that mistakes happen. And there are some mistakes when you don't get a second chance. So clearly, mistakes inside of the lab are very scary to this student. And how she's trying to battle or combat with these mistakes inside the lab, she, she relies heavily on the laboratory manual. So here you can see her expressing her thoughts about the laboratory model, saying there was a need for more detail. It was necessary to know that your reaction could fail if you don't boil it. It was necessary to know if you don't dissolve it, it could have impurities. And it was necessary to know if you don't dump the bromine in it, could overheat and your flask could crack and you know. So <coughs> she was very she was very scared of these mistakes and she often like like focused on trying to have details inside of this lab to help in her decision making. Here we have the socialite perspective. So inside of the lab, there are also some students who focus on the social aspect of lab. Here we have Anthony, where he's talking about the lab. It was just a fun lab in general. I made a lot of friends in the lab, and it was just fun to be there. So this was the most enjoyable experience he got out of the lab, not necessarily um, the other, the other experiments that he's looking at, but he's looking at this experience of, of um, make, uh, the whole laboratory experience, experience in the context of his social uh, interactions he have with it. So here we have him talking about his advice for, for future students inside the lab. Here is advice, he says, make friends. Like, for sure, make friends is my advice. Yeah. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Compare yourselves to other people's compounds, which he's talking about. Um, to find out you know, more about other people's substituents, uh, he said, being able to not only make all of your compounds and understand them, but to be able to see the wide variety of compounds that you can form and what they look like. So that's how he's able to make sense and understand inside of the lab. He's looking at other people's compounds in comparison with his. Even though this is an individualized experiment and each student makes their own compound, he still looks at other people's compound in a comparison matter to see how is their substituents comparing to his own. And we have another perspective here, the independent and um, perspective, where they're concerned about this independent aspect. Here we see Meyer saying, I like that they gave us a lot of freedom to do, like towards the end, to do like make the compounds that we wanted. So she liked that aspect of being able to choose what she wanted to make at the end of the lab. Myers further goes on to say, uh, in the lab, they expect you to remember a lot of things from Orgo 1 and like how to run a, re uh, run a reaction under reef bumps. So it's a lot of independent stuff that you should know already. So I just felt independent because you set up your own thing and you know you're just kind of doing stuff you already know how to do. So Myers are, are the whole independent perspective. It's because basically focused on being able to do these things inside of lab without the aid of a professor or a TA or some other higher being. <laughs> <laughs> So let me look at the explorer experience. Um, this experience is focused on the unknown <laughs> nature of science and the ambiguity of science. So here we have Sterling saying, it's nice to know that I don't know as much as I thought I knew. So there is more to learn. Learning is fun to me because then you can go use that information and have fun laboratories. So this explorer experience is actually looking at science in terms of being able to uncover the unknown that is inside of it. He's using the laboratory as a kind of like exploratory, I want to say playground, because he's able to perform these experiments which he hasn't been exposed to inside of a uh, lecture. And then here he goes on to further say uh, why he selected certain compounds. He said, the structure looked interesting. Yeah, the structures looked interesting, and then the synthesis roots required me using some things I'd never done before or ever seen before. Then he said, his professor, Professor X, said, um, they may work, they may not work, so I should just see if I can try my hands at them, and I went for it. So even though he didn't know whether or not his compounds were going to work, were, going, were not going to work, his reactions, he still wanted that challenge inside of his laboratory experience, and he just loved exploring that. 
So that leads me to one of my last research questions, learning. How do students' perceptions affect the way they approach learning inside the laboratory? So how all of these, um, how all these experiences that were uncovered relate to each other? And we can look at them in terms of engagement. So if you can look at uh, here, what we term level one, the apathetic experience. This student is something that we call outside, on the outside looking in, not necessarily engaged inside of the lab. So they're not really getting as much out of the lab due to this lack of engagement. But as we move up further and further and further, here we see the social life is being engaged in the lab. He's learning through other people's experiments as well as his own. And then here we end up at this level six term of engagement where students like the mastery student, the independent student, the explorer student are experiencing this laboratory environment because they are very engaged in it and they're getting a lot more out of it and learning a lot more out of it due to the increase inside of their engagement in it. So how does this all affect how we design labs? How do we purposefully design labs inside the future? Well, looking at it from an explorer and master, mastery experience, they really enjoy the elements of freedom and experimental ambiguity inside of the labs. So we want to go forth and design labs that have elements where students will not know what the outcome is. From the independent experience, we want to design experiments where it's an individual component to them where these students, they don't have the same reactions or same compounds as other students around them. That way they're solely responsible for it and they're able to feel that independence. From a socialist perspective, we probably want to incorporate more opportunities for collaboration. We can do this by things like group presentations, peer review, group worksheets, so that a student has a chance to take their own compound, compare it to others, and then learn from it. From the skill developer perspective, these are the students that are just focused on gaining skills for employment. So we want to talk or have discussions of hands-on aspects of the lab and how they're applicable in real life scenarios. How do you use the skills that you learn inside of this Organic Chemistry 2 lab and take it then forth to a company, a big company out there? And then from the time saver perspectives, we probably we want to design labs that prevent clock watching. So what we're talking about, we want to reduce the amount of time that students are looking at the clock trying to get out of the lab quickly and more so engage them in deeper understanding of the concepts. And then from the detailed oriented experience, um, we need to introduce the reality of science to these types of students and let them know that making mistakes inside of the lab is an actual thing. You can't have a perfect lab and you're going to make a mistake. We need to teach them how to deal with this um, ambiguity inside the lab and how to approach it. So that leads me to my overall conclusions. We looked at prior knowledge, like how that affects the organic chemistry students. And then we looked at laboratory experiences, how that affects organic chemistry students. But if you, get, if, you, if you think about our conclusions, prior knowledge kind of affected their intellectual accessibility, how well they were able to connect these concepts together. And in looking at their laboratory experience, it kind of affected the uh, affected factors, like how motivated were they inside of this lab. So in general, when we're designing laboratory curriculums, we can't just focus on one specific aspect of it. It's kind of an integrated, dynamic, I guess, process that's occurring inside of this organic students and multiple factors are affecting them. So when we design our laboratory courses, we have to take things like prior knowledge, laboratory experiences, how they feel in these laboratory experiences into consideration. So that was a good talk <laughs> with my baby, these are my babies. And I kind of want to thank all the people that were involved in it. I have my groups up there. This is the old, this is the new. I really have this up here because I really want to thank Chloe, my undergrad. She's like awesome. And I really want to thank Montana. She's also my next undergrad. I'm working with her. It's so special. And my group as well, of course. Dr. Morin, you know, you there. I, I want to thank you for that too. <laughs> Training me up in the way. 
uh, is different types of students. Uh, have you considered how the students' different backgrounds coming into the class affects how they approach the lab? Or how the they slide? engage? Yeah. How they engage with the lab? The pri how their prior experience coming into the lab affects how they engage with the lab? So one of the things that we collected from the students is we looked at, um, I guess, their past grades. We also looked at we looked at whether or not they have research experience. We also looked at the type of, uh, uh, what's it called, major they had. So, so we looked at all of those things in combination, but one of the goals of phenomenography is like we're not really classifying them or seeing how their background plays into it. The main focus of it is just to find out all the different ways that somebody can experience this. We just want to be able to identify where they fall. And the reason why they fall there, we may not necessarily know, but we, we just do the groundwork to find out what are all the ways they, where are all the possible ways they can fall, or, or engagement levels they can have. You have yeah, mentions. We've been doing it, we were doing this 40 years ago, 